Welcome to the Women and Wealth Podcast with Esther Sabo. Esther is a respected leader in the field of personal financial advice with over 25 years of experience. After going through her own significant and challenging life-changing events, she overcame fear and self-doubt to launch her own successful advisory firm. Now Esther is ready to share her practical and personal experiences to help other women clear their hurdles and brave life's transitions. In this way, she inspires women to lead fulfilling and confident lives. Hello and welcome to the Women and Wealth Podcast with Esther Sabo from Gates Pass Advisors. Today we're going to be continuing in a, a, a two-part series, really, about navigating uncertainty. Good morning, Esther. How are you? Good morning, Eric. I'm doing really well. I passed my test and I'm so relieved. So I I'm heard doing about great. That. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Remind us again what the test was for. It was the certification for financial transitionists. So I am now an official certified financial transitionist. That is awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. So where are we starting today? I know that we covered a lot of the uncertainties from last time. What are we starting with today? Well, I want to talk a bit more about the stock market volatility because we've certainly been experiencing that a lot more than we have in the last almost 10 years. So mm -hmm. I thought I would start there. Okay. Sounds good. I mean, it doesn't sound good, <laughs> volatility, but <laughs> but for today's conversation, it sure does. Well, it's part of what happens when one participates in purchasing and owning mm -hmm. stocks in any part of a portfolio. We all know that it's wonderful when they go up and we get those nice gains, high single digits, double digits. That's mm -hmm. great. But part of the deal is what goes up can come down. So it is participating in the downside as well as the upside. Yeah. Absolutely. We know that the probably the most volatile time was back in 08 and 09. Can you touch on kind of how that affected people's thought process and, and their desire or drive or lack of to continue to participate in that type of environment? Yeah, that was, I mean, the whole 2000s, obviously, very much so specifically 2008 and 9, but also market being down in 2000, then 2001, then 2002. People just starting to feel comfortable again, and then 2008 happens, yeah. and it. I I kind of reflect on it as if people have PTSD from being in the market for the decade of the 2000s. How do you see that affecting people then? What I've seen is that they're scared. There's a lot of fear that can happen, and and it gets triggered by when we have volatility like this. Mm -hmm. So it can cause people to make really poor decisions. Either, if you recall back from my termite podcasts, one of them was just freezing. One of those termites is just freezing mm -hmm. and not being able to make any decisions about anything, even though there is a decision not to do anything that has happened. But it's just not being able to move because it's so scary, the idea of, market loss, any kind of loss. And the other thing I can see people do is make really quick decisions of typically selling. I remember from that time in 2008 being at my gym and this young woman was saying, okay, I'm done. She was talking to a friend. She wasn't talking to me. Um, I'm done. I'm selling out my 401k. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, she's in, she's probably no more than 35 years old. She's not going to pull on those funds for, uh, you know, hopefully not at least 30 years. And this is a great time to just keep buying in. People can make really poor decisions that can impact them for a long, long time. Yeah, so indecision or quick decisions, that was a, a huge issue back then. There was different reasons for the volatility back then. What are some of the reasons for the volatility today? Yeah, this is really important because of, again, what I call in shorthand PTSD. It's easy for the brain to think, well, market's down. This is going to, this is, it's, everything is the same. It's the same as 2008. It's all going to fall apart. Things going on now, it's, it, we have a very strong economy. We have very low unemployment. Mm -hmm. We have very low inflation. The issues going on right now have somewhat to do with the concerns about this brewing trade war between China and the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uncertainty. We've all heard the market doesn't like uncertainty and it's not for sure how that's going to work out. 
so far, even with the tariffs that are in place, we haven't felt them too much here because the Chinese currency has sunk so low. So it's still relatively inexpensive for us to buy their goods because our dollar is stronger than their currency. That's one of the reasons because our administration would like to place tariffs on virtually everything coming out of China, and that will impact all of the consumers mm -hmm. as well as the businesses, including agriculture. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. And then our Federal Reserve is, is broadcasting that they're likely to increase interest rates fairly rapidly. There's not a lot of consensus in the market or among economists that that is really likely to occur, but that's what they're saying. And when interest rates go up, then there's a couple things that get triggered there. Or when the message is that interest rates will go up, there's a concern that that will be stifling to growth. Uh, if you think about home mortgages, uh, what will it do to housing if people have to pay more for uh, moving into that house, purchasing that house? Mm -hmm. Housing isn't a huge part of um, the economy, but it is significant. And with interest rates potentially going up, that also can create more opportunities away from the stock market for people to comfortably invest. That's creating some volatility. And then part of it is like this big dose of who knows, who knows what makes the market move as it does. It, it, it just is. So there's a there's several things going on right now. And there's probably a number more factors, but those are the most critical ones currently. Absolutely. And, and I have some friends that are realtors and we've been talking quite a bit and one of the gentlemen brought up that the housing market is going down a bit, but it's not going down as in there's something bad happening. It's actually correcting itself because the housing market has been so high. And I know that, especially in your area, the housing market has been mm -hmm. crazy. It's actually correcting itself. And so it's making it a little bit more fair, if you will, if you want to use that word, fair for buyers compared to sellers. Sellers aren't losing a ton. It's going down just because it's kind of correcting itself and it's going back down to normal, what we would call normal prices. So people have that, you know, again, it could be a termite. There's some fear there. I have to ask you this. What do you do in the situation like this as, as an advisor and what should your clients be doing right now? Well, it's really important that we have contact with our clients. That's one of the main things is that we reach out, we see if clients would like to meet or talk about anything right now with regards to the markets or, of course, always their, their personal situation that we put out information about what is going on and what our thoughts are that we are not overly concerned about what's happening right now. And in fact, it can create some opportunities in the market for managers to purchase stocks at a cheaper price than they were able to earlier this year. It really is part of what happens when we participate in the stock market. So it's communication, communication, communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, during 2008, I got very few calls in. We reached out a lot. And I, I hate, in a way, to keep drawing it back to 2008 because we're, we're not in a 2008 mm -hmm. environment at all right now. But it is because it's so important to communicate out. But for, the, for every client, when we did have the scheduled meetings, it's important, and as we do it now, it's important to confirm their strategy and say, this is your allocation, reminding them that what one hears in the news, which is typically what's happening with the Dow, mm -hmm. that it's off 400 points, 450 points, something like that. Well, uh, there's very few people whose portfolio is only comprised of those 30 stocks exactly. in the Dow. So it's not a good apples to apples comparison. S&P 500, okay, that's many people have mutual funds, securities that are owned within the S&P 500. The S&P 500 itself has become extremely concentrated and very much moved by the stocks that are at the the largest held stocks in that in index, the Apples, the Microsofts, etc. And that also is not going to be that indicative of someone's portfolio mm -hmm. overall, unless they're heavily concentrated themselves somehow in those particular securities. So it's reminding clients to pay attention to the news, that's fine, but then it's to come back to our own strategy that we have with them, how their portfolio is allocated, why we have exposure to those boring old bonds in a portfolio and those other types of securities that mm -hmm haven't been, you know, going, moving, 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 because they are there as ballast during challenging times. Yeah. And just making sure that they are connected with their own 
plan to make sure that uh, what else is happening in your life, what else is going on, and has anything changed? And if it hasn't, then it's just a, a confirmational review. And most clients leave saying, okay, I'm not going to pay that much attention mm-hmm. to the news. And it's it's true. It's like we have to focus on what we can control, not what we can't. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think that's great. And I, I hope that all of your clients are listening to this podcast. It's great information. Uh, but even more so, I hope that people that aren't your clients are listening to this podcast. So that leads to my next question. What about those that are not currently working with an advisor? I think it's really important to check oneself and say, am I not taking action because I'm comfortable where I am and it makes sense to me? Or am I not taking action because I don't know which way to go? I'm afraid. I get overwhelmed when I have these discussions and they're hard for me. Why, if someone isn't taking action that they should, to really look, are they experiencing that termite of immobility or the opposite one? Are they feeling compelled to sell or liquidate or make a big change? Those are the things to check in oneself about because, again, as I mentioned earlier, Going with either of those can be really undermining to one's longer-term financial security. So I would recommend if one does find themselves in that either of those boats to reach out for assistance, to reach out to meet with someone, to have an independent mm-hmm. review. I realize that that's not necessarily the easiest thing. One might sit and realize that they're thinking a lot about their money, but they're not doing anything, but they're thinking a lot about it. And neuroscientists have said that when we find ourselves holding lots and lots of different thoughts, that's actually immobilizing in itself. It mm-hmm. can feel like we're doing something because we're having so many, so much time thinking about this, perhaps obsessing about it. And One suggestion that they make is to do what's called a brain dump. So that might be what someone could do, which is where you basically write it all out, write out all the things that one is thinking of. We do it here with clients Mm -hmm. uh, because this this happens to everybody. And when they come in and they've just got, especially if one's in transition, there's all these different thoughts about where am I going? What should I do? I've got this to do. I've got to take care of this for my children. I have to take care of this for work. I'm tired. I don't feel well. I have, you know, taxes due. It's writing it all out. There's something very relaxing when one can be, maybe not always, but Mm -hmm. I know in my experience too, when I just put it all out on paper, all these things that I feel I have to do, then it's separate from me. It's not just something I'm trying to juggle all these balls. I can look at it very objectively Mm -hmm. with less emotion. And it starts to make the whole thing less overwhelming and and maybe brings it into right size. Because I think so many of us in this lives that we lead, these really busy lives, we can have this going on. And then what do we do? We don't necessarily move out into meaningful action. We maybe turn on the TV and binge watch some shows on Netflix Mm -hmm. or, or eat more than we should. I mean, those are probably my main two things I have to watch out for. Putting it all out there says, okay, well, what can I do for 15 minutes today? And that 15 minutes may be, let me reach out and make a initial phone call with an advisor and talk to them about what they're seeing. And that can take 15 minutes and then that one is done. Yeah, absolutely. Or do, doing this brain dot. This is one of the biggest tips that I work with when I work with clients when I'm coaching them is to have a pad of paper by your bedside, right? As, as business <laughs> owners, it's the same principle. When you have right. something that you're chewing on and thinking about a lot and, and mulling over or, or are worried about, write it down. You know, you, something wakes you up in the middle of the night, just write it down just to get it out so you can get back to sleep. Because that's the biggest thing for me is I won't sleep. I'll just sit there. I'll, right. I'll lay there thinking about something. And like you said, one of my, one of my go-tos is if I just want to clear the brain, uh, it's still there and I haven't written it down, but I just want to kind of clear it out for a little bit. It's binge watching and I love snacks. <laughs> you know, like you're talking I love about, snacks. Like, oh yeah. I can just grab a bag of potato chips and all of a sudden I'm like, that's an empty bag of potato chips and that is not a good thing because it was like the full size. <laughs> so yeah, no, absolutely. Getting these things out uh, is so important. And then once they're on that paper, making sure that you're not throwing that paper away because then it's just still there. 
we put those in, in priority. What do we need to deal with yes, first? And exactly. so just like you're talking about. So what else, what else could they do? As part of this, too, when they look at this, it, it, that's one of the reasons, too, just to continue with this list piece. It is saying, as, as part of my work as a financial transitionist, it's one of the things we do is exactly what you said. What things need to be done now? Mm-hmm. What things need to be done soon? And which things need to be done later? And things may need to be done now. We're getting towards the end of the year. And it could be things like, gosh, have I maxed out my 401k? I've only, you've only got till December 31st to do that and whenever your last payroll is before that. Mm-hmm. So you might want to go ahead and do that. You might want to look at have the this downturn in the market, has it created opportunities to take some losses that will offset some gains? Or if you have, say, even a flexible savings account through work that you've maxed out, you've got to, I guess they do give you now until March, but spending that down before the end of the year to make sure you're making your appointments that you might need to spend on that money. So those are all things that are could be on the now list to take care of. And obviously always self-care. Make sure that that's in there because none of us make good decisions if we're running ourselves ragged. Mm-hmm. The other thing I would say is if it is making one too anxious, turn off the news Take that time. I mean, the news, I I guess in my mind, I still think of the news as watching the six o'clock news or the five o'clock news, which is on television, which is really not how most people consume their news. Not even I consume my news that way. So it could be turning off the radio. Any media. Yeah. Yeah. Just getting off those alerts. Yep. I've had to turn my CNN and Fox News because I had them both going at the same time. I know they battle each other, but I would have those alerts come to my phone and I got about a month into that and I was done. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is, <laughs> they are never alerting me of anything relevant or yeah. timely. So I'm like, you know what? And I'm done. Uh, it's yeah. just not good stuff. It's just distracting. Absolutely. And upsetting. Yep. So separate, moving off from the market for a moment, there's uh, also some other things that are really challenging about navigating uncertainty. And one of those is when one receives or their loved one receives some kind of a health diagnosis mm. that really plunges someone into uncertainty. Yeah. That is a transition as well. When I talk about women in transition, it's typically one says uh, due to loss of a spouse, due to death or divorce, or due to sudden money events that are exciting, but really challenging, such as an inheritance or business success. But receiving a diagnosis of a health issue is also a transition because one's life does change very dramatically that it really changes the focus of that day. If you go back to that brain dump list we were just talking about and then think you've got this list, you're going around your day and then you go to the doctor and you get this very serious diagnosis. Well, that list suddenly changes in Mm -hmm. terms of priority and relevance. Mm -hmm. With that, it's also really important though to connect with those people who are supportive of us and not with those who may try and tell us what to do or how we should handle it. I know going through my husband's health diagnosis, he made his decisions about how he wanted his health care to go. I would have made other decisions, but it's his life and his body. And so those were certainly his choices. And it would be, it was amazing to me how many people came and were making suggestions about what he should do and how he should go see this specialist or that doctor or do it this way or eat this food and or juice these juices yeah. and do all of this. And it's all well-meaning. But when, on, when one is on the receiving end, it's very overwhelming just to try to follow that's one protocol. Point. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's a difficult thing. So handling that really has to be sharing it with those that you feel most comfortable with and then thinking of a one-liner for those who may come up and make suggestions that are well-meaning, but really aren't supportive. It can be as simple as, I appreciate that I'm, I'm going this way right now, but thank you so much and moving on. And if they say it again, just saying the same thing again and not feeling like you have to explain why you're going the way you're going. It's really none of their business. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it, it really it really isn't. I mean, it's, it's nice of them to suggest things. But if I see one more post on Facebook about how es- essential oils are going to save the world. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, the mint one smells fantastic. I get it. But it's not going to cure, you know, the, the, my hair loss or whatever. You know, <laughs> just please stop telling me that. So, yeah, I, I get it. And, and it, it's unfortunate. But sometimes you do have to be a little forceful with that message to say, you know what? I do appreciate what you're saying. But. 
I'm working on this with either my doctor or or whatever, right? So mm-hmm. being able to, I'm just going to go ahead and stick with that. Thank you so much for your concern. And like you yeah. said, sometimes you may have to reiterate it. And sometimes it's like a salesman, you got to shut that door. Right, right. And you may say, well, but you're a financial planner, you're a financial advisor. What does this have to do with what you're doing? And it's because this is what happens in real life. Mm-hmm. These are the things that go on in real life. I believe the financial services industry has done itself a huge disservice by continuously and always focusing on the investment portfolio only to the exclusion Mm -hmm. of so many other things. And the investment portfolio is important. It's important. It's well run. It's important. The fees are transparent. It's important that it makes sense. But it is one slice of that pie of a financially stable life. It is not everything. So what we do is these things come up. So we've got specific tools to say, okay, again, going back to you get a diagnosis that is significant, that is a life-changing event. Hopefully it will resolve well, and and there are certainly many instances of those resolving well. But in the meantime, until you know, you're in a stage of transition there, which is characterized by needing to make a lot of decisions, needing to think about things differently. So we do, again, that brain dump with somebody and say, okay, what of these things have to be done now Mm -hmm. and which can be put off? And we really support people and our technical expertise lets us advise them for things like, well, let us handle the tax loss harvesting. That kind of, we shouldn't put off because it's by calendar year and the IRS, I'm sorry, doesn't care about your health situation. Mm. So let's take care of that. Let's make sure that you're okay financially, that you've got enough coming in to take care of expenses, that everything that you plan can be covered over, or let's decide if we want to push some things off. And then it's allowing the client to just focus on what they need to do, knowing that we've addressed collectively what has to happen now and confirmed that their portfolio is being managed in alignment with their situation now as well as a longer term situation. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really helpful for just lifting that burden off. Esther, earlier I kind of brought up uh, one of the things that was housing. And I was just curious, I, I know the people I'm connected with have told me different things. And uh, I was curious if you had any thoughts when it comes to uncertainty in the housing market. Do you have any thoughts on that and how they can navigate that uncertainty? Yeah, it's housing is a really challenging area. I've seen it more and more come up in the past 10 years as housing prices here have gone up so much. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you're an owner, it can feel good. But you know what? It's not always great to for the owners either, because they know that they have a valuable asset and they're aware that they may need to sell. But the question is, where do I go? Because once Where I live, once you sell, it's really hard to stay Mm -hmm. because all the prices are high. It's very, very challenging because the asset itself is not liquid. And there are a couple of clients that I'm thinking of where one in particular knew for years. she's, She's relatively young. She's in her 50s. But she knew that her, as a result of her divorce, that she would need to sell her home. And even for five or six years before she even came to see me. And she loves this home so much. I'm not going to say that men don't have the same feelings about their homes. uh, And I'm not going to say that all women have the same feelings about their home. But I've found this for many, many women. The home is their heart. This Mm -hmm. is where they connect to others. They raise their families. They have community come in. It's where Christmas is celebrated or Hanukkah is celebrated and those fabulous events and memories are made. And it's very, very hard to sell a property and go on. Yeah, It's very much one's identity, who they are in a way. And again, this isn't just gender. There are certainly women who feel like this, but it's similar to how we've often thought thought about men in retirement, that men are so identified with what they do for a living that retirement is a very challenging transition when all of a sudden you're not the kingpin in a particular area or not a producer in the same way in a particular area. And how do you fill that? The same for women can be 
leaving their home. It's very much their identity. And it's very hazy about the future. When this was said to me a long, long time ago in a completely different context, I was uh, just turned 17 and I was getting ready to leave home about three months later. And I was talking with them about some of my ambivalence about moving away. It actually wasn't so much about leaving home. I, I was very excited to <laughs> leave hmm. home. But I was, I, my plan, I, and which I executed, but my plan was to move about 600 miles away. And I remember expressing a bit of regret about this. And they said, yes, because all you know is what you're leaving. Hmm. And I think that is so true that that's a statement that stayed with me through all the changes in my life. As one moves forward, all one knows is what they're leaving behind before the, the future becomes the present and becomes past and is more clear. One of the things that I'm speaking with her about, and we're just navigating through bit by bit, there's not a magic bullet to this stuff. I, I really commend her for keeping engaged in the dialogue and not going to that termite of immobility. Just keeping engaged in a dialogue is very important. But what we're talking about is to look at other areas where she might live, to consider renting there for a period of time before she even sells her own house, possibly rent her home. She's not sure if that's something she'd really be comfortable with because that would mean other people were living there and mm -hmm. that might just be too hard. But, um, and that's, you know, we just try and turn over every possible leaf. And at the same time, she is very much aware of, as we discuss on the flip side, the impact for her of not selling the home, how that is going to impact her next 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. And she gets to make that choice. Yeah, that's got to be tough. And, and I agree 100%. I don't think it's sexist or I don't think it's you know skewed one way or another. I think it's very true that for the most part out there, I believe that women are the ones that are in charge of really decorating the home and choosing the furniture that matches best. And I know my wife is, I, I really don't care. Can I sit on it? Does it, does it help support <laughs> me and my bag of chips? Then fine. Then just, we'll just get that. So I, I could see that. And I think it's awesome that it's, it's something that she's willing to, like you said, turning over every leaf, looking at all these options, because some of them are going to be bad options for her. She's just not going to like it, like you said, but mm -hmm. through that process, being able to find that one option that does fit and that she is comfortable with and that she can take that one small step forward, right? That, that, right. that gets her moving instead of freezing up, like you said. I, I think that's great and very right. important, obviously. That immobility is really hard. It was funny. I actually I actually fainted about a month ago. I, I tripped on a step and fell, and it was just on ground. It wasn't on mm. concrete, but I was with my boyfriend, and when he picked me up, I passed out. And I do have very low blood pressure, and that's what we think it, it was. But he said, <laughs> he said it was very hard to move you, like he, when he, he, I, I, he, to, because you were not helping. You yeah, know, you yeah. were, you had fainted, and you were not helping, and you were kind of dead weight. And uh, it's like that kind of thing. You know, it's much easier to move in a direction if we're helping with one step. But when we're just stuck and stopped, it does not feel good. If one can allow themselves to just engage to mm -hmm. stay engaged with dialogue, working with someone who has technical experience as well as presence, communication, awareness with you. Uh, my experience is it has really allowed women to take really challenging steps forward at their pace towards lives that they really found that were much, much better than their minds were warning them away from. Mm -hmm. It really can be very well done again at one's pace. And I hate to bring up stopping, but we are really low on time, Esther. Do you have any closing thoughts for us today? I think the main thing is to know that uncertainty is just very, very common. And taking, again, that step towards reaching out and considering other options is very well done with another party that really is present to you and understands you. Yeah, that's awesome. I agree. Thanks for your time today, Esther. I appreciate it. Well, I've enjoyed it, Eric. Thank you so much. You bet. And thank you all for listening to the Women in Wealth podcast with Esther Stabo. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Esther comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Thanks again for listening. 
For everyone at Gates Pass Advisors, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Women and Wealth Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you receive notifications of new podcasts as they become available. Check out the website at www.gatespassadvisors.com for more information. This content is developed from sources believed to be providing accurate information. The information in this material is not intended as tax or legal advice. Please consult legal or tax professionals for specific information regarding your individual situation. The opinions expressed and material provided are for general information and should not be considered a solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security.